Of the many ways to communicate, nearly everyone finds that speech is the most satisfactory for conveying ideas. The simplest speech situation is provided by a single speaker and a single listener. During speech, speaker and listener are temporarily connected by events which might be called a speech chain. The message to be sent begins as thought activity in the speaker's brain. Thought is then organized in the form of words. And the brain sends a message by way of motor nerves to the muscles that control the speech organs. These muscles then perform skilled movements and produce disturbances in the air, minute pressure changes which are transmitted as sound waves. The sound waves arrive at the listener's ear and are converted into mechanical movements of the hearing mechanism. Sensory nerves connect the inner ear with the brain, which finally changes the nerve impulses into a linguistic message. The speech chain consists of a series of different kinds of events. One of these, sound transmitted in air, is a physical action, and its form and qualities are well known. In another of these actions, physiological mechanisms first produce and then receive the sound waves. Although a great deal is known about these mechanisms, there is still much to be learned. The most complicated and least understood events of the speech chain are those which arise in the nervous systems and brains of the speaker and listener. The source of energy for the sound waves of speech is a stream of air which comes from the lungs. But before the air from the lungs can be used to generate speech, it must be converted into audible sound. For many speech sounds, this conversion is accomplished by the vocal cords. The vocal cords are basically two strips of muscle which form a valve mechanism between the lungs and the oral cavity. They open and close rapidly. This interrupts the stream of air, producing a series of puffs. With the aid of a suitably placed dental mirror and high-speed photography, the action of the vocal cords can be slowed down in these pictures, the action of the vocal cords is 250 times slower than normal. The vocal cords alone cannot produce speech-like sounds. If they were removed from the vocal tract, they would sound very much like a party noisemaker. With different tubes or resonators, the sound can be changed. In a similar way, the cavities of the vocal tract act like a tube and resonate, modifying the buzz of the vocal cords, as shown in these slow motion x-ray pictures. The resonance of a glass tube can be demonstrated with an audio oscillator as a sound source a small loudspeaker connected to the oscillator's output, and a microphone whose response is displayed on this meter. By turning the dial on the oscillator, the sound it makes is varied in frequency. Without the glass tube, the intensity variation is quite smooth and increases steadily with frequency. Now the loudspeaker is taped to one end of the tube and the microphone placed at the other so as to pick up the sound coming out of the tube. The sound from the oscillator is again gradually varied in frequency.
the meter shows that the sound coming out of the end of the tube increases in loudness at certain frequencies. These are the frequencies at which the tube resonates, and they are called its resonant frequencies. The vocal tract is also a resonator. However, it is extremely flexible, for in connected speech, the shape and size of the cavities are changed by movements of the tongue and lips. This, in turn, alters the resonant frequencies. The resonant frequencies of the vocal tract are called formants. Each puff of air sets the cavities of the vocal tract to ringing at their resonant frequencies until they are excited again by the next puff. The more frequent the puffs, the higher the pitch. Ah, ah, ah. The resonances, or formants, determine the character of the sound. Ah, e. These resonances are changed by movements of the articulators. The light gray area indicates the cavity in use. In the word you, for example, the sound begins with the lips and jaw open and the tongue forward near the roof of the mouth, close to the position it would have for the sound e. A transition is made to a shape with the tongue humped further back and with the lips rounded in position for the sound o. E. O. U. U. The speaker can also lower his soft palate to connect the nasal passages to the throat, and the resonances of the nasal cavities will contribute to the formants of the nasal sounds. M. Mm and N. Mm. This formant structure can be seen by using a sound spectrograph. How are you? How are you? How are you? The sound spectrograph analyzes a sample of speech by measuring how much energy the speech contains at frequencies from 50 to 7600 cycles per second. The written result is called a speech spectrogram. The speech to be analyzed and its phonetic transcription have been written at the bottom of the sheet. The horizontal axis represents time with the total length of the recorded event being about two seconds. The vertical axis is the frequency scale. The darkness of the spectrogram at any point shows the relative intensity of a particular frequency at a certain time. A dark area indicates high intensity, and a white area, low intensity. Formants appear as dark bands, which shift in frequency as time progresses. In this sentence, for example, the second formant makes large changes in frequency, while the lowest formant remains relatively constant. So far, only speech sounds brought about by vibrations of the vocal cords have been considered. Ah, ooh. The fricatives are another type of sound, much like a hiss. They are produced when air is forced through a small opening. Sounds of another type called plosives are made when excess air pressure in the vocal tract is suddenly released. <laughs> Human speech is made to be heard. The external ear is the beginning of a path to an intricate little organ in the inner ear. And it is here that a connection is made with the nervous system of the listener. 
The sound waves travel down the ear canal to a stiff membrane, the eardrum. The pressure variations of the sound wave set the drum into vibration. At the eardrum, which is the boundary between the outer ear and middle ear, pressure variations in air are converted into mechanical motion. The eardrum's movement from its rest position is very small. In normal conversation, it moves about one millionth of a centimeter, which is about 100 times the diameter of a hydrogen atom. These tiny motions are transmitted to the inner ear by three small bones, which together act as a lever and move a membrane called the oval window, which is the entrance to the inner ear. The inner ear consists of an intricate system of cavities in the bones of the skull. One cavity, coiled like a snail shell, is called the cochlea. And here, the important transformation from acoustic vibrations to nerve impulses is made. To see the parts of the cochlea more clearly, suppose it could be uncoiled. It is filled with fluid and divided along most of its length by a hollow fluid-filled duct called the cochlear partition. The cochlear structure is excited through the oval window by motions of the small bones in the middle ear. As the window moves inward, fluid is displaced toward the small end of the cochlea. If the motion is slow, the fluid passes through an opening in the cochlear partition, and then back on the other side to the large end. There, the round window, a membrane-covered opening into the middle ear, moves outward to accommodate the flow. It is just this kind of pressure adjustment that is made by the ear in a moving elevator. Sound vibrations are too rapid to allow this kind of action. Rather, pressure variations set up in the fluid cause the entire cochlear partition to vibrate. The position at which the partition vibrates with maximum amplitude depends on the frequency of the sound wave that reaches the ear. For high frequencies of oscillation, the bulge in the partition is near the oval window. For lower frequencies, it moves further away. It is believed that this conversion of frequency of excitation to place of largest vibration of the cochlear partition plays an important part in pitch perception. Lying in the interior of the cochlear partition is the organ of corti. It converts mechanical motion of the cochlear partition into a form which can be transmitted to the brain by the nervous system. The organ of corti consists of many minute cells. Here, connections are made to the fibers of the auditory nerve. The cells of the organ of corti rest at one end in the basilar membrane, and at the other, are covered by the tectorial membrane. When the cochlear partition vibrates, the cells of the organ of corti are stimulated, and nerve impulses are produced which travel along the auditory nerve, eventually making their way to the brain. The auditory nerve is a collection of about 40,000 individual nerve fibers, or neurons, consisting of a cell body a long extension called an axon, and many short dendrites. When a neuron is stimulated, it will only respond if the excitation is above a certain critical value called its threshold. When the excitation is above threshold, an electrochemical reaction is triggered, which travels along the axon. If the excitation is below threshold, there is no response. Messages along the nerve differ both by involving different nerve fibers and by varying the rate of impulses 
transmitted in individual fibers. No single fiber in the auditory nerve extends all the way from organ of corti to the brain. Each neuron is connected to other nerve cells at junctions called synapses. Transmission across these synapses depends on the activity of a number of neurons. The brain contains billions of these neurons interconnected by synapses. Patterns of activity in this complex network lead to the sensation of sound. The details of how the information in a sound wave is coded for transmission to the brain are still an unsolved problem. Many of the exact processes involved in the speech chain are still to be understood. To this end, research into the nature of speech and hearing is taking many forms. Hearing experiments in an echoless room. Experiments with physical models of the vocal tract. And electronic voice coding. In some of the research, the computer has become an essential tool. In one type of experiment, the computer is programmed to act as a numerical model of the human vocal tract, producing synthetic speech. There are more than two factors here. Men strive but seldom get rich. That I should off mind, I'd like to say a few words about Texas. In their continuing search into the nature of speech, scientists have even occasionally programmed the computers to generate artificial music and singing. Thanks for listening.